So this is um, kind of the way we're going to do this. Let's see if it works. Has anybody tried to look at it? I know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it worked. It worked online. It was pretty cool. Is it better than voiceover it PowerPoint? Was. It was better than that. All right, well, we'll, we'll try this for a while and see how this works, and hopefully um, it'll be a little bit better. I just wasn't too too thrilled with the voiceover PowerPoints in terms of getting feedback and in terms of um, really explaining things, so I think this will work a little bit better. All right, so where are we at? So hopefully by now, you have a, a little bit of an idea about physical petitioning, so then how contaminants are physically kind of associated with different types of substances. We talked about precipitation and dissolution processes for a couple of lectures. And so today what we're going to do is start talking about another mechanism through which sediments are associated or contaminants are associated with the sediments. And that's as an adsorption desorption process. And so um, this will be made available on Blackboard, so you can uh, we'll have it both through the video, the Blackboard video here, YouTube video, as well as the slide set. But anyway, this is covered in your textbook. This section is going to be pretty complicated for a lot of people who haven't got a background in chemistry. So I encourage you to go read these materials. We're going to try to go through it fairly slow. Um, it is a complicated process. Um, and I'm certainly not an expert in this particular area of geochemistry. So we will get through this. We'll see why it's so important to understand adsorption processes, adsorption, desorption. It is the primary, one of the primary controls on contaminant concentrations in water and how much we're going to find in the sun, partitioning between water and sun. Okay, so this is kind of a summary of the different mechanisms through which we can stick essentially contaminants onto a set of how they're associated. If you remember, all of these things are referred to collectively as sorption. So we have sorption up there. And then we have these other methods. So we already talked about precipitation. In that case, we're taking essentially constituents in the water, we're combining them so it forms a solid, and we're transforming or transferring the stuff from the solution into a solid, right? And in this case, this stuff down here is the mineral. And so we're putting that over the surface of that mineral, which is very common. We're creating a coating over that surface. So that's what, you know, in part we talked about in the last couple of lectures. Down here, this is this thing called adsorption, and we're not going to spit absorption with a B, and we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that, but there's two ways in which it occurs, actually. One is diffusion, so these cations kind of diffuse into the outer part of this mineral layer, and so they become part of that crystalline structure of the mineral itself. They're locked in that mineral structure. The other one is this co-precipitation, so we kind of get um, dissolution of that surface and re-precipitated on it, so we have kind of a co-precipitation. And this diagram is trying to illustrate the cations kind of get reincorporated in that stuff that's over the outside surface. In both cases here, the stuff that's absorbed is part of the crystal structure. It's not very bioavailable. It's really hard to get that stuff out of the mineral and into biota. It's also not all that important for us in terms of processes, in terms of total processes. So this is what we're focused on today, this absorption thing. And we're going to see that we're going to kind of split it into two different parts, two different kinds of absorption, which we're going to call, our, call the outer sphere complex and the inner sphere complex. Now, what was the difference here? If you remember, adsorption differs from precipitation because we're taking stuff out of solution and we're putting it onto the mineral grain but it's not forming a distinct 3D kind of pattern. It doesn't have the basic characteristics of a mineral itself. So it doesn't have a distinctive structure to it. Everybody want to see that? 
So it's not like precipitation, where the precipitation, we're actually forming a mineral with a distinct composition, distinct structure. In this case, we're just taking this stuff and we're sticking it to the outer part of this mineral, and we're doing that in part through electrical charges, so at least in large part because of the electrical charge on the mineral surface. Now we're gonna be talking primarily about minerals, but this is a process that's very important, not only for true minerals, but the amorphous minerals like iron and, and manganese uh, hydroxides, as well as things like organic matter. So this process will, would apply to all of them. We have three same, new water kits to try today. Okay, questions? The first kit we're going to look at all right, is the so hydro let's look generator at this charge. made by Mike Arklin, Pittman oh, Project. Is this hydro generator yeah. shares many of the parts Mike like uses in his windmills, like this hub and gear set. Mm -hmm. I have no These idea. These vents drain the spent water from the piece and a hose is used for the water supply. All right, thank you. Okay, so let's look at the charge on the mineral surface. This, it's this charge on the mineral surface going to drive everything that we're talking about here with adsorption. And this diagram kind of shows us the distribution of charges that we find. And this, so this is our charged mineral surface. In this case, it's showing it as a negative charge on this mineral surface. And we'll see in a minute why that charge exists. And then as we get further and further away from that mineral surface, you can see that the charge decreases, okay? And we can measure that charge. And what happens then is that we have this layer here with really high charge on it, it's called the stern layer. And then you get away from that, we have this kind of a charge double layer out here, okay? But it has less charge. Now, what, because of that charge in nature, we always want to balance that out, right? So we're going to balance a positive charge with what? Negative charge. And a negative charge with a positive charge. So what we're going to do here is we're going to, if this is a negative charge, it's going to attract positively charged ions to it, right? And they're going to try to cancel each other out. And that's what this diagram is showing. So as our concentrations as that charge is there, it's the concentration of positively uh, charged ions is going to go down, and this is going to go up, so it becomes totally balanced. We're going to start taking negative and positive and putting them together so that it becomes balanced. And as farther we get away from that surface, um, more likely it is to become balanced out. Okay. Yeah. So it's positive and negative balanced in the stern layer or unbalanced? It's still unbalanced. Okay. Yep. So out here, we're still going to have an unbalance in this, this diffuse layer, what they call it, double layer. Um, it's still going to be unbalanced. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at this from kind of a, a, a schematic diagram of cations and anions. So let me describe these guys. In the center here, we have cations in this diagram. So these are positively charged ions, mag, uh, magnesium, which has a plus two in this case. These guys floating around, that's water. So we have two hydrogens stuck to an oxygen. We have our stern layer here. We have our diffuse layer here. Charge would be decreasing away from that mineral structure. And what we're doing now here, you can see they're just kind of randomly distributed. Here they're going to become more, less randomly distributed, but they're going to be attracted to this surface because it's not perfectly balanced yet. And then in here, we're really going to stick stuff in there in a very well-defined kind of organized pattern. Okay. This stuff in here, which is adsorbed to that mineral grain, we're going to call chemosorption. And this is the inner layer 
kind of adsorption setting. Okay, so it involves exchange of hydrogen and oxygen. So what do I mean by that? As this cation comes in here, down in here, as it stick to this, sticks to this mineral surface, we're either going to exchange OH, um, hydroxide ions, or hydrogen, hydronium ions, depending on the pH of the water and the charge of the mineral surface. Okay? So as we're sticking stuff to it, we're actually kicking hydronium or hydroxide off of that mineral surface. And it's really those two things are going to control the charge, and we'll see how in a minute. Okay, with me? Out here, we're going to call that physiosorption. Some people would call it physical sorption. It's a, this is the outer layer. And the bonds tend to be weaker. They're actually held in place almost per, totally by Van der Waals forces, which is an electrostatic force. In here, we have much stronger bonds. In fact, they could be like covalent bonds where we actually share electrons. Okay? So these are going to be really strong, stronger, much stronger bonds. These are going to be weaker bonds. Why do we care? What happens if it's a weak bond? Can we pull that off the surface? It's going to be easier to pull off the surface. Yeah, exactly. It would be easier to pull off the surface. And if it's easier to pull off the surface, it's easier for it to get into biota and things like that. If that maybe that particle is going to be ingested. It'll get into the body fluids, and it'll just be pulled off that surface. So stuff out here is easier to pull off. This stuff's more tightly bound between these inner and outer layers. Okay? All right, a couple of terms to remember. They're really, they can be difficult to just remember them. Uh, the zorbate, that's the stuff that is getting adsorbed to the surface. So it's what's in solution and is the cation or anion that's getting adsorbed to the surface. The zorbent, that is the sediment. That's the mineral that it's being attached to. Okay. So you'll hear those terms, and you'll see those terms in text and literature. Zorbate, what's being absorbed. Zorbent, what it's going to. All right. Kind of questions on this inner and outer. Okay. So the other thing that we're going to talk about a bit is something called an absorption site. And what that is, it is a specific location on this mineral surface that's defined by the charge and the distribution of the kind of atoms that are stuck on this mineral surface. So we can't simply stick these cations everywhere on that mineral surface. There's only particular locations that it's going to stick depending on the charge and the nature of this mineral surface. Things like its porosity and its shape and all of that. Make sense? So there's only a certain number of these absorption sites that actually exist on a mineral surface. And when all of those absorption sites are filled, we can't stick any more to it through adsorption. Okay? We only have so many there. <coughs> What's the opposite of Adsorption. Desorption. Desorption. So adsorption, we're sticking it to it. Desorption, we can actually take stuff and kick it out. Okay. So let's take a look at why that charge even exists. And it's really based on two very different things that are going on within these minerals. So this is our total charge on the mineral surface, and it's dependent on something called the permanent structural charge. That is due to what happens in the mineral. Okay, that's a characteristic of the mineral itself as it exists. The second part is this, is this thing, this reaction charge, and that's charged due to chemical reactions that are occurring around the mineral. So take this mineral as being kind of suspended in the water, right? And there's all kinds of things happening around it. It's kind of in the water, there's stuff in the water, there's reactions going on. 
And this charge is dependent on the chemical characteristics of that solution, of that water solution. Okay. And if that chemical characteristics of that water changes, this charge is going to change. And the permanent charge, as the name implies, it's not going to change. It doesn't matter what the particle's in, this permanent charge is always going to be the same for that particular mineral. Okay? This is going to change depending on the characteristics of the solution. And both of them together dictate or determine what the charges on the mineral surface. Okay, with me? Okay. One last step here. This guy's important because it's really telling us what types of constituents are going to be chemically reactive from an absorption point of view. This is saying, hey, what would we normally expect the charge on the mineral surface to be for that particular substance. And we're going to find out there's only certain substances that actually have a really strong negative or positive charge on the mineral surface. And so those are our chem chemically reacted stuff or constituents within a channel. This is important because it's varying with the conditions in the water itself. And so we might get things that in one case is attracting ions or positive ions, cations. In another case, in a different set of solution conditions, it'll attract anions. It'll switch. Okay, questions? Yeah, I lost y'all already. Okay. Okay. How many are geologists in here? Any? Who's anybody had physical geology, minerals? All right, so it's going to be all new to you. One of the building blocks of many of the minerals that we have is referred to as a silicate tetrahedron. So this is a very important building block in. Um, in mineralogy and minerals and earth materials. What is it? It's composed of the silica cation in the center, which is surrounded by four oxygen atoms. Okay? The silica by itself has a plus four charge to it. So its valence state, its charge is plus four. The Oxygens, I'm sorry, it's plus eight. The oxygens here, no, nope, that's not right, plus four. These oxygens have a charge of minus two. So when you add all this up, what we have is that the charge ultimately becomes SiO4 minus four. So this thing has a net charge of minus four. Okay, see that is? Now, the thing is, because of that minus four charge, we can bind these tetrahedrons together in a whole variety of different ways. And as a result, we get a whole variety of different minerals. These, again, these are the most common minerals that we're going to have in systems. So we can have just these single tetrahedra out there forms a mineral called olivine. It's green. You'd find it in oceanic environments a lot. It doesn't have a whole lot of silica in it overall. And then we can combine it in different ways, single chains, double chains, so forth. Even these complex networks that we get down here, which is quartz, and then everything in between. Right in here, we would have the micas, and we would have clay minerals that we're going to talk about. So, we have all these different ways to put those silica tetrahedra together. They're going to form different minerals. And the way we put those things together and what happens to essentially the silica tetrahedron as they're joined is going to kind of dictate the charge on the mineral surface. Okay, so these are just kind of putting this out here as this is a building block, a very common building block for what we're going to find in rivers. Quartz, feldspars, um, micids, biotites, the 
kind of dark colored minerals out there, the pyroxenes, rubles, all that stuff, are all silicates. Anybody think of one that's not a silicate? It's really common. What's that? One's a peroxide. Uh, I think that's a silicate. No, it's a peroxide. I don't know what that is, I guess. <laughs> I'm, about, in, I'm in 250 right now. How about a common one? Uh, Calcium carbonate, limestone? No silicon that. Pyrite is, isn't a silicon? Nope, it's a sulfide, right. It's so that'd be a common one, just calcite. Okay, so we've got a variety of that aren't, most of them are silicon. So let's take a look at what's causing the permanent charge on silicates, but it could be applied to any any other mineral as well. But we'll take a look at it from silicates, and in particular, we're going to look at clay minerals because they are one of the most common, highly reactive constituents that we're going to find in rivers and, and aquifers and all those kinds of things. Okay. So here's our structure, and normally has a minus four charge, right? But there's something that can happen to this periodically. Instead of a silica atom here, we can replace that with an aluminum. Silicon aluminum have about the same size diameter, close to the same charge, so they can be interchanged for one another we call this isomorphic substitution. Nothing's changed in terms of the structure here. We're just replacing the silica with a different cation, in this case, aluminum. But the aluminum has a plus three instead of a plus four. So what happens to the charge on this guy? Minus one. Goes up by minus one, right? So instead of minus four, now it's minus five. So we've increased the electrical charge, well decrease, it depends on what you look at. The negative charge is increased, right? Okay, so this substitution can actually cause a change in the chemical charge of that particular mineral or silica tetrahedron. That's part of the permanent change. Let's have a look and see how that applies in clay minerals. Okay, clay minerals are kind of like sheet minerals. They're like mica. Has everybody seen mica biotype? Yeah, so it's kind of the same idea. So we have these sheets. And in this case, the sheets are actually made up of two separate layers. One we're going to call the octahedron layer, and that's what you see here. And we have usually aluminum or manganese or <coughs> magnesium in the center. And then it's surrounded by these hydroxyl groups, the oasis. All right. Now, what can happen in this layer is that we can replace the aluminum, which has a plus three, with magnesium, which has a plus two, and it'll give it a charge. It'll give it a more negative charge. Yeah? All right. The second layer, which is bound to the top in some way, is this octahedral, or I'm sorry, is the tetrahedral layer. So these are tetrahedrons that are all stuck together. And again, we can substitute that silica for aluminum, and it'll give it a more negative charge. So through this isomorphic substitutions, in both of these separate layers, we can create this permanent structural charge on the mineral. We can give it more of a negative. So this is kind of a schematic diagram out of a soils book, actually. But it kind of shows us the two main types of clays that we can kind of deal with. There's, there's a lot of different types of clays, but these are kind of two typical end members, if you will. One is called kaolinite. That's what we're seeing up here. And it's a one-to-one -one clay mineral. What do I mean by that? It's got one tetrahedral layer and one octahedral layer. 
And that cycle repeats itself over and over, and they're stuck together by oxygen atoms and other things in here. But it's a real narrow fit. Okay, so it's really tight. So this would be a one-to-one. -one. So it's one silica to one aluminum or one tetrahedron to one octahedron, whatever you want to call them. And then that cycle repeats itself. The distance between those is really narrow, and we're not sticking a lot of cations and stuff in there. Okay. If you want to look at actual kind of uh, molecules, kind of the way it's spaced out here, this is our tetrahedral layer. This is our octahedron layer. And then we have a tetrahedron layer, an octahedron layer, and we have these kind of hydrogen bonds in between, which are pretty narrow. We don't have a lot of cations. Okay? So why is this important? Well, we have some negative charges associated with that. And where are they going to be? They're going to be out here on the, the ends of this cation, or out of the ends of this clay. And it's going to be caused by, in the tetrahedral layer, the substitution of, of um, aluminum for silica, and then down here, probably magnesium for But we can't do anything in the middle. So the, the issue here is that these kaolinites aren't very reactive. Not certainly as reactive as our other major group, which are these two to one minerals. These would be things like referred to as smectites and monogorillonite as a type of smectite and so forth. But in this case, we have uh, tetrahedral layer, octahedral layer, tetrahedral layer. So we've got this octahedral layer sandwiched between two tetrahedral layers. So that's one difference. The other one is this sandwich, which repeats itself, is bound together, but it's bound together with a bunch of different cations in between. So the distance is really wider, and we're sticking bunches of things like calcium and potassium and stuff in between these sheets. Okay? It makes it more reactive. So this is kind of what it would look like. Here's our sandwich, our two tetrahedral layers, octahedral in between. And then we've got all this stuff stuck in between it here. And in this case, the green guys are different cations. Now, in this case, the charge can change depending on which cations are stuck between these layers. Make sense? So if we stick sodium, it's got a plus one, right? We stick calcium in there, it's got a plus two. So whatever we're sticking in here can change the charge on that mineral. So they're much more reactive. And we can actually have adsorption in between these sandwiches where we couldn't have that on kale and ice. The whole point of this, what I want you to get out of it, is one, one-to-ones usually aren't chemically reactive. Where our two-to-ones two are, like, like smectites and multimillionites and so forth. And the permanent charge is being controlled primarily by this type of substitution, whether it's substitution directly in the octahedral and tetrahedral layers or the substitution of different cations between the layers. Everybody with me? Okay. Again, this is a permanent charge. It's not going to change with a particular mineral. Questions? We're going through this pretty fast, and I know a lot of you haven't had mineralogy and stuff, so it's kind of new. Okay. Let's take the second way that we can put a charge onto the green and what's driving it. And this is related to something called its coordination number. Coordination number is related to the number of atoms that any given atom within that mineral structure is actually associated with. So if we had fluorine here, this is so, uh, sodium chloride, by the way, which is what? 
Solve. 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 Yeah. Table solve. So uh, somebody wants to grab my structure of it, but in essence, we have for every sodium atom in this uh, sodium chloride, we have one chloride atom. It's a one-to-one -one relationship. The coordination number, if we have chlorine here, it is always bound to sodium, and it's going to be bound to six sodiums. So chlorine is bound to these six, four in the horizontal plane, one below and one above. Doesn't change. Same thing with, with sodium. If we have sodium over here, up here, you can see it's bound to four chlorines, one chlorine below, and if we had something up there, it would be a sixth one. So the coordination number of both sodium and chlorine here is six. See where I'm getting at? But what happens on the edges of this crystal? Here, up here, out here. We're missing one, right? This guy's only only associated with five. It's got these guys and then one in between. But at the edge of that crystal, it should be bound to another chlorine, but it's not. There's nothing there. So we're missing a chlorine. So that's going to give it a charge. So on the edges, because we're kind of, we don't have, it's not what they call fully co uh, coordinated. It's not bound by all of the atoms that it should be bound by. We have an electrical charge on that mineral surface. With me? Okay, so that's the coordination number. This is because it's not fully coordinated. So what are we going to stick to this thing? And that's an absorption site. We talked about absorption sites already. Okay. So what we're going to do first is we're going to take a look at what happens because we have this charged surface in here, right? We have this charged surface, this mineral grain because of substitution and coordination and things like that. That charge is really strong in this stern layer. So let's take a look at what happens in this zone. And I guess I was just showing coordination. Entire slides here. I don't know what happened. Probably the most important slide of all. There it is. I don't know why it's way down there. Okay. I don't know what's going on with this thing. I kind of had some annotations to this, but we'll go through it without the annotations. So here's our mineral that, and it has a charged surface, and that charged surface is related to the coordination and substitution, right? So we're going to, in part, essentially neutralize that charge by hydroxide with a minus charge and hydronium with a plus charge. Why are we using these guys? That is, if you put those together, what do we have? Water. So we've got disassociated water. So we're always going to have hydrogen and hydroxide in the water that this mineral floats around in. The question is, how much of those two are going to be present in any given setting? What's the relative concentrations of hydrogen uh, cations, hydronium, versus the hydroxide? <laughs> All right, at a pH of 7, we're going to have equal concentrations, right? And if we have a, an acid solution, we're going to have a plus, we're going to have more hydronium. In a basic or alkaline solution, we're going to have more hydroxide. Okay? 
So our how we define, in fact, pH is based on the concentration of H plus, the hydronium ion. So when it's high, it's more acidic. Everybody with me? All right. There is a pH for every mineral. It's going to vary from mineral to mineral at which the charge on the mineral surface is perfectly balanced by these hydronium and hydroxide ions. And we're going to call that the point of zero charge. It's going to be perfectly balanced. So for every mineral out there, there is a point of zero balance of charge at which that some pH at which we're not going to have a charge of that mineral. It's usually kind of over a range, a small range, but it's going to be there. Are you with me? Okay, this is the important part here. And if we increase the hydronium concentrations in here, we're going to have more acidity. If we have more hydronium, Hydronium ions, there's going to be a tendency for these guys to go onto the mineral surface. It's going to drive this thing this way. And I don't know why it completely annihilated my equations up here, but in the text, if you look at the equations, what we can do is we can take this guy here, for example, we can stick it onto this surface, and what do we get? We get this guy up here. And that has created a positive charge on that mineral grain. See what happens? So when we have a lot of hydronium floating around in the water, there's a tendency for it to combine. And when it combines, it creates a charge, and that charge is positive. So what is that mineral going to attract? What kind of ions in the water? Negative. Negative or anions. So under low acidic conditions, what we're going to do is we're going to create a positive charge which attracts negatively charged ions in the water to its surface. Yeah? Okay. So that's, that's an important part. What happens if we had, in addition here, these, this M is all referring to a metal cation. But we could also, in that process, we could actually dislodge metal ions, it's positively charged ions, and stick them into the water as well. Things like lead, cadmium, copper, zinc, are we going to stick it onto this surface? No, because they have a positive charge, right? They're all positive cations. So under these acidic conditions, we're going to stick anions on there. We're not going to stick cations. We will stick some. But I have a tendency overall to stick very few. Let's go the opposite way, though. Let's say that our, our mineral grain, with no charge, but this time we stick it in a more basic solution, so pH is going up rather than down. It becomes more basic. What happens? Well, in this case, we essentially take hydronium ions. That's what's causing it basic, right? we got all that OH floating around out there, that hydroxide. It tends to go to the surface now, and it binds and forms water. So we, if we had this, we'd end up forming, take that hydrogen there, combine it with an OH, and we get water. And what are we left with? We're left with these guys. And it has a negative charge now. So it's going to attract what? Oh. <laughs> yeah, cations, positive, right. So in this case, under basic neutral conditions, we've set up the charge here such that it's going to attract cations. Completely opposite. So the same setup, the same mineral under different fluid conditions, different pHs, are attracting completely different ions and cations. Yep. And it's going to be dependent, whether it's high or low, relative to the, the uh, zero point charge 
of that mineral grain. So what pH is actually creating a neutral condition? Above that, we're going to get this scenario. Below that, we're going to get this scenario. Yeah? Good? Okay, so that's that's important. We get completely opposite characteristics. That's related to the charge of the solution that changes. This is really crazy. I don't see it all what happened here. Okay, so the key points. Kind of backwards, but the key points here then is that under low pH we have an excess hydronium in the water. It forms a positive charge on the mineral surface. Cations go into solution, and it attracts anions. When we have a high pH, we're going to have excess OH. Those are going to go into the water, form a negative charge, and we're going to attract cations. So that's the summary of this. If we look at this diagram, it's exactly what it's showing us, right? So in this case for zinc, so we're looking at concentration of zinc here at different pHs. As the pH of the water becomes more and more acidic, we get more and more of those hydronium ions in it, we get more of the cations in solution because it's attracting the anions and the cations are going off. It's it's such that now it doesn't want to attract, it doesn't want to bind those cations. And so at low pHs, we get this. High pHs, we swap that, right? And now it wants to bind all of those cations. And so the concentrations here of those cations in the water are low, but they're high on the sediments. So we've changed the distribution of how much of that zinc so our zinc's floating around, how much of it is going to be with the sediments versus the water based on the chemistry, the pH of the water itself. Okay? Everybody with me on that? Okay, why do we care about this? So I'll finish it up there. Here's two commonly asked questions if we're dealing with a contaminant. It, doesn't, it could be trace metals, it could be PCBs, it could be anything else. It's going to be how much of that contaminant can be absorbed before the absorption sites are completely filled. And part of that's going to be dependent on the nature of the permanent charges on that mineral, how reactive that mineral is. What's the configuration of the surface? Does it have a high surface area? What's the porosity so it can get inside? All of those kinds of things. Okay, it's also going to depend uh, on the, the uh, solution charge. Okay. The other one is if we say stick the contaminant in the river here, or maybe even in groundwater, and it's going to flow away from it, how far can it move away from that site? before all of it is absorbed to the sediments and stuck to the sediments. It's no longer in the water, or at least the concentrations have decreased so much because they're stuck to the sediments through adsorption that it's no longer a problem. It's below the toxic levels. Okay, So we stick this stuff in. It starts moving downstream. Some of the contaminants in that water are going to be absorbed to the sediments, right? Are you with me? Okay. So we got we want to answer that question all the time. If we stick it in there, given the conditions that we have in the water, the pH of the water, um, all of those things, how much of that stuff is going to be absorbed to the water or to the sediments, and how much is going to remain within the water column? And if it remains in the water column, it can go a long ways downstream. It can just go. Okay. So we answer that a lot of times by something called a distribution coefficient or a partitioning coefficient. Um, and what this is, it's a relationship between the amount that's in the water versus the amount that is in the sediment. And we can, this is the way it's initially written, where this is the concentration aqueous, so that's what's dissolved. X here, that's the weight of uh, the absorbent or the absorbent, that's the sediment. Okay, so 
and then this is how much is on the sediments. We can rearrange this, and X here, if we always have sediment, which is almost all the cases in natural systems, right? We always got tons of sediment along the channel bed, the banks and suspended in it, and so forth. So this essentially becomes one. And so our partitioning coefficient, or distribution coefficient, is the amount absorbed to the sediments versus the amount in the water column. For any given sediment, in any given condition, solution conditions, that's essentially going to be the same. So it will tell us, we can figure out for a given water in a given sediment, how much is distributed between water and sediment. For pH change, it's going to be different, right? So how do we get at this? So a lot of times this is done in the laboratory through something called column tests. And you see different setups of columns here. Sometimes we'll just drop water in it, we'll let it percolate down, and then we'll measure it at the bottom here through time. Uh, sometimes we'll force it upwards, sometimes we'll do these multiple things. But in each case, we take, a lot of times we'll take the natural sediment that's out there, or something that we, we want to test. We'll take the water that's out there with the certain levels of contaminants within it, or we'll make some assumptions. This is the water and we're going to put a certain concentration within that water based on what we want to test out. Okay, And then through time, we'll just keep pumping water through it, and we'll figure out how long it takes to get to the bottom of this column. And that's called the breakthrough time. And what have we done? Well, as the water starting to move through this column, it starts getting absorbed. And it'll get absorbed, adsorbed, until all those absorption sites can be completely filled, right? And so it'll continue to move through here, and at some point, all of this thing becomes completely saturated with the contaminants. All the sites get filled, and we get really high concentrations. The concentration here just kind of shoots all the way through. So we can figure out, we can test what these coefficients are, and this will give us some insights into how far downstream the stuff's gonna flow, what our absorption capacity of those sediments are, how likely it is for those elements to be absorbed to the surface. Make sense? So that's kind of what we're trying to do a lot of times in these types of these studies. It also works for um, remediation as well. So I don't know how many people know Dr. Carmen in chemistry, but she's actually looking at peanut shells and saying, okay, can we use peanut shells to extract copper out of water in a treatment sense? And they're doing the same kind of things. They use a certain type of column tests and other things to figure out, beaker tests and so forth, how much those peanut shells can actually absorb to the surface under different sun conditions. So we can use this from a remediation point Okay, I'm going to stop. I know this is a lot, especially if you haven't had mineralogy and things before, but the textbook covers it as well. So if you have questions, go through the textbook. If you still have questions, come in and see me. I have office hours from 11 to 12, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Send me an email, something like that. We'll try to work it out. We're going to find out that we're going to keep, continue throughout the semester referring you back to these relationships, particularly how pH can influence whether we're getting absorption or desorption of cations onto a part of the All right, we'll see you next week. Uh, don't forget the quiz that's online. It's due by Friday evening. Thank you.